Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, to, to speak with y'all. Um, but actually, first and foremost, thank y'all for the work that you do. The, this is the greatest work of our time, uh, making sure that the next generation of Texas has a, has a better shot at success than the last generation of Texas. And you are change agents leading teams of loving and highly skilled educators to provide our kids uh, with what we should, which is, the, which is every child in, in this state should have, the, have a chance of success for lives of meaning and purpose and productivity. And it is because of people like you and the, and the skill and love that you bring to your craft um, that, we have, that we have success in this state. So I just want to say thank you um, uh, really from the depths of my soul for the work that, that you do for our kids. <clears throat> Uh, about about five, five and a half years ago or so, I decided to um, run for the school board in Dallas, which was, a, um, uh, from the outside looking in, I think a little bit odd. I, I ran a software company for about a decade, uh, and this was my second company. The company, and it, it had been fairly successful. I was actually able to sell that and be um, quasi-retired in my early 30s, which is, uh, which is certainly good work if you can get it. Um, uh, uh, but it, it took a lot of hard work, for sure. The first, the first four years or so um, with this company, I was working probably 80 hours a week. I paid myself maybe $15,000 a year. Um, I, I didn't go out on any dates. My friends knew that if, if I was going to go out to, to dinner with them, they were having to buy. Um, you know, it's, a, it's the American dream. You, too, can own your future if you're willing to work twice as hard for half the money. The... the but uh, luckily, you know, we, we turned a corner and we were successful. And, and that wasn't the case with my first business, we, which was a, really a catastrophic failure. Uh, it, was a, you know, it, was, it, was, it was a problem in many, many ways. And, and you certainly learn more from your failures than you, you do from anything else, which actually I think is very important in our classrooms as well, trying to encourage and nurture points of failure in our kids because I don't know how else they will really learn effectively. Um, but but the, the successes that I achieved um, uh, stemmed from a couple of things that I don't know that I had a whole lot of control over because, of course, I worked really hard, but I didn't get to pick my schools. When, my, when I was about 10, we moved to Texas, and my mom called TEA, and somebody eventually said, move to Garland, and here's my, my Garland ISD folks. Um, they've, they've, they're... They're doing this new innovative open enrollment model district-wide, but they've created this vertically aligned international baccalaureate magnet uh, uh, pathway. And if your kid is lucky enough to get in there, um, he'll get a great education. And I did. I came out of Garland with 36 hours of college credit. Um, and uh, again, I worked really hard, but you know, you don't, as a child, you don't pick your schools. And I was, I was blessed beyond measure to, to have extraordinary educators um, uh, support my education. As, as a kid, and, and you also don't really get to pick your parents, and I, I mean, if I did, I don't know that I could have picked any better. I was born to two parents that loved each other and loved me very much, and they weren't wealthy, but I never really suffered from want, and, um, and it, you know, it just, it doesn't get any better than that, but that's not the case for everybody. I've, I've been a big brother now for about 10 years, and I've had two different littles in the Big Brothers program, and my first little, we were matched for about six years, uh, and it, it's a, being a big is, is fulfilling, it's emotionally rewarding, it's, it's, it's what you see, of course, in your role mentoring so many young people in your schools and out of them, um, but sort of trying to remove myself from the, system, uh, from the situation and thinking about it sort of intellectually, juxtaposing my own life with the life of my little, I mean, it, he, he never knew his father, and his mom was... I mean, filled with love and wanted the best for her boy, but um, was in and out of rehab most of the time that we were matched and, and couldn't get it together. And, and he bounced around to several different schools in Dallas, DISD schools. And despite the fact that these schools were filled with very hardworking educators that wanted the best for him, that, that, that you know, angels uh, working in our classrooms, it was clear that he just sort of passed through the system. Nobody... Nobody ever laid hands on him and said, I will not let you get past me. The this, this system let him down. And I, I mean, I know precisely how well it let him down. When he was 16, we went to, uh, he, he was going to apply for a job at Brahms. And so 
I helped him fill out the job application, and I realized that while we were doing that, he, he, he couldn't do it. He was functionally illiterate. A 16-year-old passed up through our system, and it just... I, I, um, I, we'd been matched for a number of years, and I was running my company um, with, a, with a fair amount of success. But I just got to a point where, I mean, I saw him, and I, I couldn't let that continue. I could not let this happen to however many kids it happens to in a system that isn't, isn't designed um, for, for kids today, to give, them, to give them all the chance of success that we want them to have. And so I, I uh, you know, I'm governed by a creed that says that that you do for the least of my brothers you do for me, and I decided because of that creed that I was going to throw away a perfectly good life as a software executive, uh, making a decent amount of money, and walk away from my company and devote myself um, to the needs of our kids in Dallas on the school board. And so I ran for the school board, which is a you know, great decision, very fun job being on the Dallas school board. Nobody ever questions your integrity or motivations or judgment in any way. You're, you're nothing but supported by, by a very actively involved community. It's a great, great situation. So um, I haven't regretted it at all. Certainly I did not intend or plan at that point to become commissioner of edu education for the state of Texas, but I'm certainly blessed that the governor has given me this opportunity to serve kids um, throughout the state of Texas because I'm, I'm proud of what we were able to accomplish. I'm proud of what our educators were able to accomplish in the last several years in Dallas. The, the agency, though, is a, it's a different animal. I'm not, I'm not a school board member anymore. I'm at the helm of um, a fairly large executive agency for the, for the state of Texas. And so trying to figure out what do we do at the agency, what, what can I do in my role to be most effective for kids in the state of Texas, a lot of that involves listening. Um, I, I think I understand urban education fairly well, although I don't have the depth of operational expertise of anybody in this room in terms of, of actually delivering results for kids, but I, I, I feel like I have a sense of knowledge, but I don't understand our rural settings very well. I've got a lot to learn there. Some of our fast growth suburban areas, it's an incredibly diverse state, so I'm on this, uh, statewide listening to her to sort of learn as much as possible, but I do have a sense of priorities um, for the agency and for me, at least initially. And so the first and I think leading priority is supporting educators. You know, no system of schools can, um, you know, no, no, no set of students can outperform their teachers. And what we do to sort of love on those who love on our teachers is, is critical. Um, uh, ensuring that they have that teachers have resources to be effective in the classroom, that they um, engage in a process of continuous improvement, that those that are entering the profession are prepared for what is uh, absolutely the most difficult job that, that we have on this planet, um, simultaneously operating on 20 upright brains uh, that are giving you active feedback. It's a, it's a job far more difficult than, than neurosurgery. Um, the, the job of teaching is a tremendously challenging profession uh, demanding the highest level of skill and expertise. And so what can we do as the agency to support educators? I mean, I think that is our number one priority. Uh, we know that, it, that uh, teacher quality, that teacher effectiveness is the number one in-school factor um, supporting kids. And what we do to support our teachers, um, to love on our teachers uh, who love on our kids, that's, that is priority number one. Uh, that's not easy. It's much easier said than done, incidentally. So I haven't done any of this yet. I'm... I'm I'm working on it, but that's, I think, priority number one. I think priority number two, though, comes from my experience as a school board member. One of the, one of the most difficult things that I had to do as a school board member shouldn't have been um, as difficult as it was, which was basically figuring out, are our schools getting better for our kids? Are they staying the same, or are they getting worse? This is, you know, when you think of the role of a governing body, it's to sort of look at that sort of system level performance and, and make judgments about whether the strategies that you have in place are moving, are moving the system forward for kids. And it was virtually impossible for me to figure that out, certainly with the information that TEA provided me as a school board member. <laughs> so, uh, it's marginally ironic in my current position. So, I, I, I use that to inform, I think, what I, is our second key priority, which is talking about 
what our expectations are for our kids and clearly defining them. What is it that we expect our kids to be able to do? And from the level of an individual child, sort of rolling that up into a level of a campus, what, what kind of outcomes, what kind of, of, of expectations do we want to see our schools uh, perform? What, what, le what level of delivery, what level of execution do we want to see in terms of the outcomes at, the, at that campus? This, this, I think, is a very important priority. And this, ultimately, the, you know, the way I phrase it around expectations for kids and expectations um, for campuses has been phrased using other terminology in the past pretty consistently, and that's the conversation around accountability. But the, it's, you know, we, we, we use accountability, I think, far more as a stick than as a carrot, and, and we do have to focus on outcomes. We do have to focus on getting results for our kids. It's, it's not enough that we work hard. Uh, it is not enough that we might even work smart. We actually have to deliver results for kids. We have to make sure that they are prepared for for lives that are, that are meaningful for them, that they are prepared for the demands of being a citizen in this great republic, uh, that they are prepared to take care of themselves and their families and their, and their communities. Th this is the outcomes conversation. This is the expectation um, uh, that, that we have to develop. And that's very hard. I mean, I, I talk to, to business folks, people that have my background, that you know, we just need to run education like a business. And there's, there's truth in that because we spend money, we hire people, there are business processes that, that we need to use to improve our operations. But in businesses, figuring out w whether you're going in the right direction or the wrong direction is pretty easy. It, our earnings, you know, is profitability going up or is profitability declining? Is there, a, you know, what's the earnings per share of, of your company? There is no earnings per share in public education. There's no agreed upon framework for what, what our outcomes expectations are. And, and that's, that's what makes this so difficult. That's what makes my, you know, my job as a school board trustee, my former job, so difficult. It's just figuring out, you know, is what we're doing actually working for kids? And having some sort of, some sort of sense going through this process as a state to say, what do we Texas think our expectations are for our kids. What do we Texas, what do we Texans think our expectations, our outcomes should be in campuses? And, and there is a difference between average performance and good performance and great performance. You are campus leaders, you know this. There is a difference between excellent uh, and, and average and poor performance. And, and we have to sort of clearly define it. I think this this is what makes me optimistic. This is the, the naivety that I have as an entrepreneur is that, you know, when everyone else tells me something is not possible, I, I know that it is possible. And this is what I think we can do with the, the conversation about accountability in the state. This is my second priority is getting that conversation around the state right or as right as possible so it, we sort of in the aggregate think this is a good reflection of our performance. And it's, it's not just a measure of what the kids walk in with, but it's a measure of school level, school level effects on, on those kids. That's, that's the key part of, of our outcomes conversation. Every kid that walks in, we wanna grow them, and we wanna grow them at least a year, and we'd love to grow them more than a year. That's the key conversation that we have with regard to outcomes. And that's, I think, priority number two for me is to get that conversation right and meaningful and useful and put tools in the hands of decision makers, most, most importantly, principals, uh, to improve our, our data-driven instructional practices. Because if we have you know, some sort of sophisticated accountability system, we have numbers and metrics, and nobody uses those to help kids' lives, then the numbers and metrics are useless. That's, that's what we have to do, is we have to make sure that this is, in fact, useful for us in helping kids. My, th my third key priority for the agency is just the agency itself. I mean, this is a regulatory agency focused on compliance, and you heard David talk about it uh, before. We have got to shift out of, out of a compliance mindset into something that supports performance, because, you know, compliance has a place. The legislature asks us to do certain things, and we need to verify that we are doing it. But I don't know of any kid whose who's, uh, fire was lit because of some compliance checklist, right? Um, so what we have to do is we have to support the efforts of hardworking educators in the field to continuously improve. And, and I think that 
if to, to the extent that I'm talking about outcomes for campuses, you know, charity starts at home. We better, we better have good outcomes within the agency. We better know what it means to be a successful agency. Heaven forbid we ask you to do something that we don't ourselves ask um, of ourselves. Uh, uh, so, I, you know, I, I'm, I might be comfortable with a certain level of hypocrisy. I, I was an elected official after all, but I'm not comfortable with that level of hypocrisy. Um, so anyway, so these are the three key priorities, I think, that, that I have um, in, in the job. And there are, of course, other priorities. I can talk about early um, childhood education until, uh, until I collapse from exhaustion. The, the, um, there are other things that are important for us to get right. But, you know, the management requires discipline. You can only do a few things well. And so you've got to figure out what are your high priorities and focus on them as methodically as possible. And so that's, that's what I think I'm going to try to focus on here over the next, uh, next year or two. And, you know, once I get those knocked off, then I'll move on to something else. Um, so anyways, that's, that's my priorities um, as, a, as commissioner. Uh, and before I'm sort of done talking, because I'd love to, to take questions. I don't know if we're, we're okay for questions. But so before I'm done talking, though, I figured I would share with you the sum total of my knowledge that I've gained in the last four and a half years as a school board member. When I, when I decided to, again, walk away from a perfectly happy life and uh, in my peak earning years, um, uh, take a job that doesn't pay anything uh, uh, and that rewards you largely in the afterlife and with pain in this life, the, the, I wanted to make sure that I was doing that and, and did, did right by our kids. I wanted to be as informed as possible um, so that I, I tried to accomplish something that was meaningful for kids. And that's really you know, it's difficult because a lot of times we don't know. We don't know, you know for years until, until they grow up. Um, uh, that's one of the key frustrations I think policymakers have in, in public education. It's such a complicated space. But I spent a lot of time studying this. I read everything that I could po possibly read, books and white papers and um, various, various things on the Internet. And, you know, they were on the Internet, so I know that they were true. And... Um, <laughs> And, you know, I would talk to parents and teachers and principals, of course, all over Dallas, but really all over the country. I'd get on the phone with some sort of edu, edu wonk from coast to coast and, and try, to, try to distill as much knowledge as possible. And everybody's telling you something different. And it was a, it was a fascinating learning experience because I would read one book, and one book would say, you know, this, this, is, this is right and true and clearly the answer. And then I would read another book, and the, the other book would say the exact opposite thing you know, no, this is right and true, and that other thing is actually we know to be false. Um, so it's like separating the, the, the wheat from the chaff is, is pretty difficult in this space. But what I, what I discerned from this can be boiled down into what, what I refer to as four key leverage points for change. Um, and the four key leverage points for change are governance, human capital, instruction, and scope. And so what do I, what do I mean by that? So governance are the people at the helm, are the, the folks that are making de decisions from the top down, are they making decisions focused on what's in the best interest of kids, or are they making decisions for other reasons? Do they have incentives to make decisions for other reasons? And as a school board member in Dallas ISD, I assure you we had ample incentives to make other, other kinds of decisions. Um, but beyond that, are we focusing on outcomes? Do we even understand that whether outcomes are improving? Are we, are we discussing only process and inputs? Are we, are we making outcomes-based um, governance decisions um, for what really will be in the best interest of our kids? It's important to get this right. Are we, from a, from a culture standpoint, an organizational culture standpoint, do we establish a culture of servant leadership? Or do we, uh, do we establish a culture of compliance and fear? Do we encourage risk-taking and innovation? Because without that, there can be no change. And that's fine as long as we're happy with the results that we have today, but I'm not particularly happy with those results. Not to say that they're, they're bad. They're about as good, actually, as they've ever been. But that's just still not good enough. Um, and so this is the, the central question of governance, is, is aligning incentives and focusing on outcomes and focusing on organizational culture in a proper way. And that's in a, we are, you know, it's a democratically elected um, uh, public education system. That's much easier said than done. And whether, even if it wasn't democratically elected, it's much easier said than done. So let's wave a magic wand and solve our governance problems. And what's next? Well, that's, this is the problem of human capital. And this is a problem that you all know all too well. You have to have a great teacher in every classroom. You have to have a world-class principal in every school. And this is incredibly difficult to do in this country. You know, if you go to Korea, 
and you ask any, you know, random Joe on the street, and probably they don't refer to them as Joes, random Kim on the street, and, uh, and you say, what's, what's, uh, what is your cliche about teaching? And they will tell you, parent, king, teacher, all are equal. Now, they've got something figured out over there. You fly, fly back across the Pacific, and you ask anybody, any random Joe in the United States, what's your cliche about teaching? And they say... Those who can do and those who can't teach. Right? You, you guys have heard this. This is a fundamentally broken view of the most challenging, most important profession that we have in this country. It is, it is corrosive to our ability to recruit and retain and motivate. And, and it's pervasive in this country. Um, that cultural problem is deeply ingrained. And I don't know how it happened. It didn't used to be like that. Um, I know it didn't used to be like that because I, I watch old movies with my wife. And when you, like Blanche Dubois, the crazy lady in, uh, in A Streetcar Named Desire, she was a teacher. Not that those are two related things. But, but <laughs> whenever, whenever, she was, whenever she was introducing herself as a teacher, they were like, oh, college girl, you're smart. I get it. Absolutely. Right? Our attitude with our 17-year-olds in this country should be, you know what, you are pretty sharp. You're, you're a go-getter. You should think about engineering, but you're not quite there yet to be a teacher. That's, that's the attitude we've got to have. This is fundamentally the human capital problem, and of course, whatever problems we have at the teaching core are even more acute in the area of principal leadership, because y'all have to know teaching um, as well as anybody knows teaching, and y'all have to know leadership and management. Uh, and th those are skills that are developed usually with lots of scars on your back from having made terrible decisions and living with them and changing, <laughs> changing along the way, right? I mean, that's the way we grow um, in, in terms of our leadership capacity. So this, this is the human capital problem. So let's wave a magic wand and solve that one. Would love for that to happen. This, this then brings us to the problem of instruction. And so the problem of instruction, I think, is a problem both of what and how. And when I think of what, we have a standards-driven educational model. And this is, this is good. It's, you know, we're focused on English, math, science, and social studies, grade-level expectations that have been defined. Um, these are the academic skills that we're preparing for our kids. This is the what and the kind of curriculum and instructional materials that we plan for. That This is the what of education. But as it turns out, I, uh, I have discovered my life is just a little bit more complicated than knowing English, math, science, and social studies. You know, sometimes it's about looking a man in the eye and shaking his hand and keeping your word. Sometimes it's about when you stumble, picking yourself up and dusting yourself off and trying again. It's about having a heart filled with optimism, which has, does so much for your health and your ability to be productive. It's, it's having a, um, a mindset around growth um, rather than the, than the fixed mindset. It's about um, thinking, thinking a, 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 about life um, with nothing but gratitude um, in, in terms of everything that you're exposed to, which is really the opposite of entitlement, which becomes so corrosive to the human condition. Like these... We all know, our teachers know this, our teachers are teaching this. Certainly parents know this. These are important skills. These are actually teachable skills. We know enough about psychology, we know enough about the brain to know that, that these are skills. But we don't necessarily formally reinforce them in our current standards-driven model. And so that's got to change. The, the, that's the sort of what problem of instruction. Then there's the how problem of instruction. And you all, of course, are all too familiar with this. You've got a classroom full of 25 kids and 10 of them are like three years behind where they need to be. And five of them are a year behind where they need to be. And you got, you got eight in the sweet spot, kind of right where you want them to be. And you got one or two that are uh, ahead of everybody and they're so bored they're setting the trash cans on fire, right? And somehow you have to get this same, this disparate gr group of human beings to the same place at the same time at the end of the year. This is a logistical impossibility and yet we do this every year in every one of our classrooms. So that, that how of education has got to be sort of thoughtfully improved. And it's a lot easier said than done, for sure. So that brings me to my sort of fourth lever of change, and this is the lever of scope. 
And in reality, this lever is sort of all about Maslow's hierarchy, food, clothing, and shelter before you can get the higher order thinking skills, right? So um, if you've got fi uh, five-year-olds walking into kindergarten and they are at a three-year-old developmental level, it's gonna, give, it's gonna give you one heck of a challenge. You're gonna have to give them like a year and a half's worth of instruction every year for the next five or six years of their life to get them caught up. That's just to get them caught up. So you have to have, to have some sort of perfect teaching um, core that has, you know, the most perfect one that has ever been assembled to sort of close that gap. It makes a lot more sense to attack the achievement gap by never letting it start in the first place. Um, and this is where you think of, this is where you think of broadening the traditional scope of the K-12 system. Um, this is where early childhood education is such an important piece of the equation. Uh, but it's complicated and it's hard to get right and we haven't necessarily gotten it right even when we've tried. This is it's all complicated. There's, there's other problems with scope. You know, my, my little girl, I got a two and a half year old little girl, she's awesome by the way. Um, uh, a little spitfire and uh, certainly keeps me on my toes. You know, when, when she, as she will enroll in school, you know, we will get off for two months because apparently that's the only way to do education. Um, and um, and in, in the summer months, I'm gonna, you know, we're going to go on trips to Civil War battlefields, and she'll enroll in soccer camp, and I, you know, the nerd that I am, I'll put her in, like, NASA camp or something. Um, uh, and, you know, she's going to learn how to play the piano and everything else that I can, she'll learn kung fu so she doesn't let some uh, whoop, whoop, whoop a little gentleman call her later on in life. Um, <laughs> And, and, uh, and so these are things that will be enriching for her. So school will be educational and enriching. But her home life will be as well all summer long and after school. But for so many of our kids, what happens at school is it's an educational oasis. And when they leave, they enter this educational desert. And we know this. I mean, we've known this since like 1975. The research is pretty strong on this. There's cognitive cognitive capacity that just sucks out of the head of kids when they are deprived of any kind of stimulation over the course of the summer months. This is a yet another scope change that I think it would be wise for us to consider. Why we, why we don't give them enriching experiences longer in the day and all year round. These, these are the central scope challenges that we have. And, and this is where it gets a little uncomfortable because all these scope challenges, you know, the K-12 system is actually pretty good for what it was designed to do. It was designed to educate a lot of middle-class farm kids. And um, we still have middle-class farm kids in the state of Texas. I have seen them. I know that they exist. <laughs> we, we don't have too many of them in Dallas, um, which is a bit of a problem. And this, this system works very well when you have that setup, when you have a nuclear family that is doing everything they can to promote upward mobility in their kids. But, you know, our, sometimes our kids just don't choose the right parents. And I don't know why they keep doing this, but they don't. <laughs> and, um, and so what can we do with the public resources that come into school systems to redirect those resources to address these problems, to better support our parents, to better empower our parents, to promote upward mobility, all day long outside the classroom because we know what we're doing inside the classroom. This is, a, this is I think, the sort of greatest myopia problem that we suffer from in school systems, is that when we think of school systems, we think of them as schools and bricks and buildings with classrooms and teachers in them and grades and textbooks, um, kids going up one year at a time, this is the way we think of school systems, but that's actually not what they are. We have to sort of, we have to think about this in a, with a level of abstraction, the same kind of abstraction we want our kids to think about when, we, when they address um, advanced logic problems. We take money from taxpayers, and we take money from taxpayers to produce an objective, and that objective is citizens, to have kids that are prepared for success in this country. Now, Schools and the, and the K-12 system, the traditional system, is a good way to accomplish that objective, but it is not the only way to accomplish that objective. And we have got to rethink the entire scope and the entire structure of this system because there are too many kids like our, my little that the traditional design of the system, even despite the best efforts of our educators, just didn't 
didn't work for. So, you know, some of this stuff gets fairly radical fairly quickly, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be. We don't, you know, we don't live in a utopia. We live in the world that we live in today, and we just have to iterate through it, engage in a process of continuous improvement. Identify what works and try to do more of it. Identify what doesn't work and try to do less of it. This is, this is our, you know, our basic challenge. And so, um, anyways, I hope to try to do that as much as possible. I, my job is not necessarily to sort of you know, lead this charge. My job is to support y'all because I don't actually educate any kids. Y'all do. Um, and but, but for our schools, TEA doesn't exist and my position is irrelevant. Um, so I, I, am, I am here to support you um, in doing everything that, that we need to do to make sure that all of our kids, 100% of them, are prepared for the same kind of uh, American dream that I have had access to. That's what we've got to do. Anyways, thank you. I'll um, open up the floor to questions.